take a, a look at unified messaging and uh, a little bit on in terms of kind of the technology used, but mostly we're going to look at the business practices piece in terms of um, addressing the questions that tend to come up time and time again as we do presentations to customers evaluating new solutions. So we'll just jump in here. Uh, we'll talk a little tiny bit about who we are, um, just so you're, you have a comfort factor that, that we have a right to be uh, <laughs> holding this webinar. And then we'll look at the options, not just on our systems, but overall the way, the way unified messaging can be deployed. And then we'll kind of wrap it up with the, type, the five top considerations that we've seen as we talk to prospective customers. And um, then at the end with some questions, maybe you can uh, give us some more considerations or your comments on them. So ABST has been around. Um, actually this week uh, is our 30th anniversary, founded back in 1982. And we were doing unified messaging by 1991. So we have a long history with unified messaging. The CX product has been continuously developed over that time, and we believe we have the most flexible set of unified messaging options that are available. And we certainly have years and years of experience both talking to customers and implementing solutions in everything from a small um, single site enterprise right up through some of the largest global enterprises. And we're going to talk about what we found um, over those, those years of history in terms of unified messaging. Today we tend to talk about unified communications, that, that's the driving phrase, and we believe we offer in those areas that we're in best of breed solutions, mobility, voice and business process. And we'll kind of define what that is as we go along. Um, like I say, we've been doing this for a long time and our feature set tends to be very impressive, but the interoperability layer underneath it is perhaps um, equally as important, and we'll talk about why you want to look at that layer when you look at unified communications as we go through this. And we'll talk about the different models, as I said, for deployment um, of UC, just as we talk about it in terms of our general architecture. So a single site premise, a private cloud uh, for an enterprise, and then that hybrid model that, that tends to be fairly popular right now. So if you look at some of the surveys that have been done lately, you'll find yeah, unified messaging as part of unified communications tends to be getting the most focus right now. The, the two, those two top entries, as you notice, sort of dwarf um, what information we found. And, and they were asked, you know, as you look at UC, what are you really looking at? What are you evaluating? Where are you going to go first? And unified messaging is that top one. And that's Neil, good for us. Yes. I'm not, we're not seeing the slides changing. You're not? No. Well, I'll be kind and won't go backwards. <laughs> Let me jump ahead here. Okay, I can see that now. All right, that's the important one. All right. Um, sorry about that. So if you look at the, uh, the survey from Information Week, you can see these are the results when they ask what's driving you towards UC, why are you evaluating it, what particular solutions are high on your list. And like I said, unified messaging tends to be the most important one, and we're going to focus on that one today. And we think we have some, uh, some pretty interesting information for you. So Gartner talks um, about the UC Quadrant. They're probably the company that tracks it and, and um, gets the most attention for what they're doing. And in the UC Quadrant itself, um, to be in their quadrant, there's a list of things you have to provide, a, a rather large list. And we actually don't make it into that quadrant directly because we only focus in a very small area of this. We tend to be focused on you know, a best of breed solution. If you read the Gartner Quadrant, it'll talk about, if you look at the suites, where people are offering everything all in one package. The problem there is you don't tend to get best of breed in every solution, and then they refer to us by name saying, if you are interested in a best of breed unified messaging solution, you should go talk to ABST. So we're, we're setting our, our credentials here, hopefully, for why we're presenting what we're presenting. If you look at the Calm Fusion quadrant, and this is unlike a UC quadrant, this is tracking specifically unified messaging. We are, we're up in that upper right-hand quadrant in terms of furthest to the right for the most complete solution. Although we aren't ranked as high as I and Cisco in our ability to shape the market, that has to do with our marketing budget as opposed to our functionality. So we believe we can talk with a, a fair amount of expertise on unified messaging in the enterprise today. Our platform kind of helps us out here from the very early days. Our architecture was such that we have a UC interoperability layer, and have had from uh, long before when the term UC was used. And the interoperability layer for us means those pieces that connect to the outside world 
are in a separate segment of the application code, which lets us do two things. One, it lets us build new applications on top of that very easily and quickly. And two, it lets us change that interoperability layer without affecting the core software. So to add a new integration to a new voicemail system, let's say, um, or to a new, e new email system, it's very easy to connect based on this architecture. And then the other thing this architecture reflects is the way we've packaged um, our solutions in terms of presenting them to customers. The application tiers on the top rest on top of the UC interoperability. And the, the three tiers, UC mobility, UC voice, and business process, tend to be the categories that we can talk to an individual customer. Some customers want all those. Some are only looking for one. But this architecture lets us focus on those areas. The UC mobile piece um, contains a number of things. Um, and in this case, unified messaging is what we'll be focusing on. Unified messaging, um, we've been out there doing it, like I say, for a lot of years. And it's fairly easy in terms of concept. You want to be able to get your email, voice messages, fax messages, perhaps, all on whatever your device of choice is at any given time. And that includes um, different devices as you move through your day. So it isn't good enough just to deliver those to the phone or to the mobile client or to the email client or to the web browser. You really have to deliver them to everything so the user can control their, their work their work environment without having to not have something, one critical element available. So the second thing we look at in our environment where we sell in the larger enterprises is it's also extremely advantageous to be able to deliver it to multiple email systems. Um, while the goal of most um, IT departments would be to centralize down to one single consolidated email platform, that's sometimes a bit of a challenge, specifically with their acquisitions and mergers in process. And then there's also um, a bit of a move to at least trial, if not actually start moving, to some of the cloud-based systems like Gmail and Office 365. So our ability to take a single CX system and host an enterprise and let them connect to as many different email systems as they need and migrate users over whatever time frame is appropriate, we think is one of our strengths in terms of the overall architecture of the system. The second uh, real point there is the storage options. So that is probably the single biggest discussion we have on unified messaging in terms of where we're going to store those messages, where the, where the customer feels they have to be and why. We're going to go through the architecture pieces and talk about that. And then, of course, we have a mobile client that's going to give you unified messaging on it as well. All of those pieces are important to unified messaging. And as much as I'd love to say we have hundreds of features that no one else has, the truth is unified messaging has, has been around long enough where there's a fair amount of equality in the feature sets. In the, you know, if, I, if I see a bullet point presentation on competitors, it talks about pretty much the same things we have. We have a few little advantages depending on environments like multiple email systems and things. But the discussions really have to do with architecture. That tends to be um, what's um, most in most concern of users. So it'll be interesting now for us to run a little poll like we do here so we can get some information from you to talk about the email servers you have deployed. Okay, so let me pull up that first poll. Okay, so again, we are uh, curious of what email server or servers you have in your organization right now. Uh, you can choose multiple answers. So we'll just give it a few seconds and then see what you guys have going. Okay, just a few more seconds. Most people have voted. All right. And let me share the results. So for Neil, there's about 85% that have Microsoft Exchange, and then about 5% with Microsoft Office 360, 10% uh, for Google Gmail, about 5% for Lotus, and then 5% other. Hmm. Interesting. The number of uh, the number of cloud-based systems continues to grow every time we run this, which is not surprising considering uh, the structure and what some of the advantages are. So very good. So certainly, I'm guessing some of you, um, because of the percentages we just saw, uh, have multiple email systems. And one of the advantages we offer is our ability, if, particularly if you're if you're looking at migrating from maybe Exchange in your enterprise to Office 365. The ability to do that in a, you know, a, sta a staged manner by moving users in groups or blocks, however you're doing that, is one of the features we offer as well. So multiple email systems and uh, all the normal players as we'd expect. 
So from our point of view, interoperability is fairly easy because of that architecture piece we looked at. We simply build connectors between that lower level of the product functionality and the email system itself. And we use whatever technologies are relevant. Um, with Exchange, we might use Mappy on the older Exchange servers and web services on the newer. Office 365 is all new web services. Lotus is using their Vim protocol. Groupwise is using a modified flavor of IMAP. Gmail is secure IMAP. And then pretty much the rest of them out there tend to be IMAP for one type or, or another. And this lets us take any user and dedicate them to any different email store um, for the full range of unified messaging functionality. So some of you have, have looked at this. Some of you may have already deployed it. It would be interesting um, to take a look at what your concerns are. Okay, so for this one, we do just want one answer, which is your primary concern with your unified messaging implementation, um, whether it's compliance or confidentiality, um, if it's flexibility, if it's the message store or the cost. We have a lot of people voting. That's great. So we'll just wait a few more seconds, make sure everyone gets a chance to vote. Okay, and I'll go ahead and close it out. And it's pretty spread out. Um, so Neil, just so you can hear the results for compliance, it's about 20%. Confidentiality is 20%. Uh, flexibility is at 24%. Message store is at 17%. And then cost is at 20%. It's very interesting. I, I, I bet that's almost the only feature we could run that kind of pull on and have cost not be the absolute highest one, <laughs> because there, there are a lot of concerns. We're going we're to address, I think, all of those, um, not in terms of, of what you should worry about, just in terms of how, once you've decided what's important to you, you can configure our system and our architecture um, to make sure that we're addressing that concern. So first, we're going to run through really quickly the architectures. Um, while not a lot of people are all that interested or concerned with you know, where things are on a network um, for the general application, the message store is um, the concerns. Almost two-thirds of those concerns are all about where that message is and what those implications are. And there's really four ways to do this. And this is not just our product. This is everyone's product. Um, there's what has come to be called server-based or single message store, where the messages are stored on the email server in the user's inbox. And sometimes that's called full unified messaging. There's client-based. It's also called dual store or integrated messaging, where the messages remain on the voicemail platform, but they're visible and accessible from the email client. In other words, the unification actually happens at a client level instead of a server level. Then there's various versions of secure. The concept for secure unified messaging tends to be um, your own employees can't get those messages out of the system. They can't go file attachments saved. They can't forward them to another email address. They can pass them around within the system, but that's still keeping those messages within the enterprise. And then simplified or, or notification is where we simply send a message. So let's look at kind of the impl implications of, from the architecture point of view of each of these. With server-based, the voicemail system takes a message just like it always would, but instead of storing it in a local database, it pushes it using various kinds of message transport depending on the email system and puts it into the email message store. That message is typically, uh, it's an email now. It's an email with a WAV file attachment and it has usually a unique message class so we can handle it a little different. But most answers to questions on a feature level are, yes, it's just an email. In other words, will it appear in my email web client like Outlook Web Access or iNotes? And yes, it's just a, it's an email. Well, if I'm using cache mode on Exchange, will it get pushed to my laptop? Once again, yes. It's, if you just considered an email from a feature point of view, most, most of that functionality is pretty easy to understand. Now, we do have custom forms um, to help you play those messages in your email client, you know, and call back the message sender, click the call kind of things. There's enhancements that we put in there. But the basic architecture for this one is we make it an email. Now, all of your email tools that are presenting emails, whether it's a BlackBerry Enterprise server pushing them to your Blackberries or Exchange Active Sync or good technologies, any of those technologies will now also leverage your voice messages by virtue of the fact they're in the email store. So the concept 
um, from our point of view is whether you have write facts for facts or CX server um, basically goes into the email and there's just a quick screenshot. Uh, this happens to be Outlook 2010 showing you a uh, typical mailbox where you notice there's voice, fax, and email all in the same inbox. And in this case, because it's Outlook 2010, um, you've got the nice uh, player pane preview window with all the tools. So that's server-based. The concern about server-based tends to be if the messages are in the email, what does that mean for discovery? We'll talk about that separately as we wrap up in the end here. Server-based for hosted is effectively the same thing. All it really changes is the location of the message store and generally the protocols being used to interact with it. In our case, the right facts call express piece would push them out, and whether this was Gmail using secure SMTP and secure IMAP or Office 365 using the secure web services, same exact functionality in terms of the messages are out in the cloud. Now, in the case of Gmail, there's one difference, and that is you don't get message waiting like control. Um, for your phone when you have Gmail. It just doesn't have that feature. We do have it for 365, um, but of these two hosted ones, that would be the biggest difference between the two. And if you look at client-based unified messaging, the architecture is the messages get taken and they remain on the voice in fact, server, on our server. Now you take your client that's probably already connected to your email system, although it makes no difference to us, um, we then build a second connection to the server, and now you have a separate inbox. And that inbox has messages that are voice and fax in one inbox and messages that are email in another. From a desktop perspective, this is fairly similar. There's not really much difference except for the two inboxes. Um, but if you go ahead and look at the functionality here, you will notice there is a separate inbox that actually has your uh, voice messages in it. Now, in this case, this is an older this is an older version of Outlook showing the older form. Doesn't matter um, as far back as anything that Microsoft supports. We support the full functionality in the client for both server and client based. Secure unified messaging. This is probably the one that varies the most between different um, vendors. What they'll offer you. Uh, in our case. Um, People came to us, our customers came to us and said, we want a desktop way of getting to voice messages that is restricted, where our users can't forward messages out of the system. Up to now, voice messages remained in the system. They can forward around other users. You play them over the phone, but there was really no way for that, that, you know, that recorded file to easily get outside the enterprise. And we, we need you to duplicate that. So what we did is we took our existing web phone manager client, and that's the client that comes with a system for the users to configure their mailbox settings, and we expanded it and put an inbox in it. And now the user can look at their messages and basically play them from their browser, stream them. Um, if they stream them, there's no cache copy they can get a hold on. They can't go file attachment save. Um, and then they can delete them. They can forward them to other users, but they can't forward them out to an email address. So that's our version of secure unified messaging. And then the last one is maybe not even unified messaging so much as advanced notification. In this version, the administrator can enable any user to be able to send copies of their messages to them when they come in. So I get a new voice message. Um, the system will send out an email message to the user, and it will attach the um, voicemail has an attachment to it. There's now two copies of that message. There's one still in the email server, one out um, back in the voicemail server, and now those have to be maintained separately. So you have to delete them both or, or manage them separately. And we, we think the value of this one's a little less. So in our particular case, this one's free. You can set up any user. We don't license users on, on CX, and any user, the administrator can enable them to have simplified unified messaging. And we take it a little further. You can also enable the user to turn it on and off themselves. You can enable the user to change their email address to decide whether or not they want a copy of their messages. So admin control at the highest level, and then, then that control can be delegated down to the users. So Simplified UM becomes a nice applications tool for a wide range of solutions like contractors and things like that where you can actually extend out the voice messaging piece to people that maybe aren't even a part of your network. So when we look at all those architectures, um, if you go back 10 years, I mean, our discussions were about features. Our discussions were about licensing. They were about kind of the new things that people were coming across as they looked at unified messaging. 
now these are the five C's from our point of view. This is what we spend our time talking about in the unified messaging market. And the first one is compliance, and compliance is the most difficult one because there are corporate legal requirements having to do with e-communications. And unfortunately, those aren't spelled out all that clearly most of the time in regards to voicemail messages. So an argument can easily be made that if you put a voicemail message in your email, then whatever compliance laws you have that control your email, your voicemail goes along with it. They're now discoverable. You have to archive them, all those pieces. Um, but an, an argument can also be made that there's no specific law that focuses on voice messages. So how you deal with compliance is really up to you, but from our point of view, you simply tell us, this is what we feel we want our messages in exchange or we don't want our messages in exchange or in whatever email we're using. And you have the ability on a per user basis to set that message store location and you can change it any time. So if you go down one path and, and later on you, you get a different slant on what the laws are requiring, you can easily change that. And I have to say I have conversations with customers that go both ways where they say, oh no, we, we understand, we believe, we have to archive our voice messages and the easiest way would be to put them all in exchange and you certainly can set your system up that way. And we have ones that say, no, as long as we don't put them in exchange, they're not discoverable, so we don't want them. We don't want them to touch email at all. Once again, you can set that up. So complete freedom. Um, once you figure out what is correct for you, our system can handle it. Confidentiality kind of falls into compliance a little bit in terms of some of, some of the laws have to do with confidentiality, but some of them also simply have to do with um, there are jobs where your employees have messages of a type that you really can't afford to get out there. So maybe you would go with secure so they could pass them around in the, in the company the way they needed, but they couldn't get outside the company. Or maybe you would go with um, the client-based one to make sure they didn't get an email. Once again, the choice is yours in terms of what you believe you have to do on a legal level or even on just a good business practices level. You're going to be able to match that. And once again, the ability to do it on a per user basis um, sometimes is, is a very powerful tool. There are certainly people maybe who work on the supply chain side of a particular business where it's of great advantage to them to have their messages in email so they can get them from all the different clients. When at the same time, perhaps in the legal department, the decision is those messages need to remain more confidential and they might use the secure version. Configuration, um, one of the great things about this, and we've referred to this, is this is a per-user choice. So the first thing is, you don't have to enable every single user for unified messaging. Uh, unified messaging does require a license, and as a result, you know, if you have a lot of users that you simply want to have voicemail, then there's no need to spend the money on that license. And then once you've bought a license for a user, you now can configure the message store and the flexibility any way you want. And your ability to change it going down the road is a great future proofing in terms of as things change, particularly in the discoverability area, it's nice to know you're protected. Uh, capacity is sometimes an issue we discuss. Less so now. Um, Ten years ago, capacity was a, more of an issue. Now, um, when people ask about the, you know, the load on an email server and a storage server, I'll generally tell the people, you know, open up your email client, click on the attachment paperclip icon to bring all your messages to the top. Look at how many messages you have with huge attachments in the megs and megs and megs size range. And then think about the fact that, you know, an average person maybe gets five voicemails a day, keeps, keeps them in their mailbox for two days, and those messages are 250K. So, you know, if you have 2 meg or 3 meg of additional storage per user, that's probably pretty typical and probably not much of an issue. If it is, then, of course, you do want to control some of that. The load on the servers is interesting. We, we built kind of an architecture piece in there called a message cache, where if you call me and leave me a message, and I'm using server-based, and that message gets moved to Exchange, and I call in an hour later, and I want to retrieve that message, I'll have a copy of that audio that I left on my server, and I can actually play that message from my server, reducing our impact on the network and on the exchange or whatever email server you have by somewhere in the neighborhood of 40%. So um, just one more thing we've done over the years to improve the way that works on your network. And then at the bottom, and interestingly enough, at the bottom of your list as well is cost. Um, there's a couple of things you want to look at with cost. There's obviously the upfront buy some licenses piece, but there's also the training piece, the how well it integrates with your other environments piece, 
the maintenance piece, you know, how, how easy it is for your, you know, for you to delegate some of the things like changing simple message notification addresses. If you can delegate that to your user, down term you've reduced the load on your help desk. So these are the discussions we tend to have with customers, and uh, I think they're pretty close to being in the order of importance, um, not only from our discussions, but probably fairly close to what you, you showed us on your poll. And it's not surprising, we're all, we're all dealing with the same issues out there. It'd be interesting to know where you are with UM, and oddly enough, we have a polling question for that. Another poll. Okay, so yes, we're curious to know where you are in your unified messaging implementation. Um, are you doing it currently? Do you already have UM and you just want to add additional users? Is it in the budget for this year or next year? Or no budget at the time? At this time. Okay, and we have almost everyone looks like it's voted, so just give it a few more seconds. Okay. And the results, 20% are currently implementing, 45% uh, already have UM and are adding additional users, 15% uh, have it budgeted for next year, and then 20% have no budget at this time. I always find these polls interesting. Um, we've watched that number grow slowly over the years. In our early years of implementing unified messaging, you know, we were, we were looking at single-digit percentages for people that were looking at it. Uh, and it's one of those things that's grown continually. Um, I think it's shown its value over the years. I think the um, number of mobile devices that are out there now drives that even a little bit more. You know, if you have a mobile device and you're connected to email, it just makes sense to give you your voicemail on it as well. So it, it's interesting to watch that. I am always surprised that there are people that haven't budgeted for it at all yet. I would think the drive um, from your employees <laughs> would, would push that to happen. But it's good to have that information. Now, what can we tell you? We've asked you some questions. Now it's only fair we give you a chance to ask us some questions. OK, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, is this presentation being recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. And we also will have the slides for download available um, after the webinar. You should receive an email today. The recording will take a little bit longer. But once that is ready, we'll also send you an email with that. Uh, next question is uh, that's a customer. Let's say we are starting to use a mix of Gmail and Exchange, but we'll eventually be full Gmail. How will you be able to resolve the um, MWI light issue? So I think what you're going to find is the issue um, sort of resolved itself. In the early days of unified messaging, if you couldn't light that light when you put the email, the message in email, um, Customers absolutely couldn't accept that that would be possible. And then if you went back to that customer six months later, um, they didn't care about the light because we all live in email. We already knew that message was there. We have desktop notification pop-ups and all sorts of things that happen. And the fact that we couldn't light the light on some of the different email systems um, was only a problem during the very initial sale. Now what happens um, today, because most, most unified messaging systems for the current emails have the ability to light message waiting. We face that again when somebody who has Exchange UM now and it's lighting the light moves. But I think if you talk to your customers, your, your own employees, your own end users, uh, you'll find it's, it's not that critical. Unfortunately, with um, Gmail, there is no way to light the light. Um, if I put the message into Gmail, I have to rely on Gmail to tell me when it opens the messages. And since it doesn't, the only option would be to write an app that constantly pulled the mailboxes. And while we tried that approach in the early days, it tended to be extremely slow, and it brought the email system um, to its knees. And that was one of the early ways people tried to do with Exchange. Now, Exchange um, Office 365, just like Exchange 2010, that web services package pushes us the information we need to know to control the message waiting light. But if you're going to move to Gmail, then I think your, your, your choice is to do an education program for your users in terms of why they absolutely don't have to have that. Right now, to the best of my ability, there's no way to do a message waiting light for anyone when you're using Gmail in the cloud. OK. Next question. Um, my organization has some mailboxes in Office 365, and the rest are on-premise. Can UM work with them all? 
Yeah, no problem. That, that interoperability architecture, we have lets us build one connector to Office 365, another connector to your local exchange, regardless of whether it's 2003, 2007, 2010, it won't make any difference. And then one of the really great things is once that architecture is in place with those two connectors, as I decide to move, you know, 50 users um, across, I simply go to their mailbox and repoint them to that other connector. So it's a very painless process. Now, that changes our connection. That doesn't deal with moving the messages. You've, you've undoubtedly already uh, discovered you have some challenges in that area. But from our point of view, we can do that mix today, and we make it very easy if you're looking at migrating more users over to 365. Okay, and the next question, uh, how will end users control notifications from different forms of messaging? So we have a, a pretty good messaging engine, and most of our clients, most of our applications that users can use to manipulate their mailbox do some level of message notification. So if I kind of break ours down real quick, we have the old traditional telephony-based message notification, the call list where you can go in and you can put up to nine numbers in a list with time delays in between them. And then when you get a new message, it does the dialing for dollars, and it goes and tries and find you. When you answer one of those calls, you can log in and get that message, and the notification stops. That's traditional. You can maintain that over the telephone user interface. You can call in with DTMF commands, set that up, turn it off, add numbers, etc. Or you can maintain that from Web Phone Manager, our web client. It's a little easier to do from Web Phone Manager if you're doing complex things. And then that whole other step in Web Phone Manager lets you say do things like, I'm going, I'm going out on the road today. I only want to be bothered when I get that urgent email message from my boss. So go ahead and, and notify me when I get that urgent email message or when I get the urgent voicemail message from my boss or only notify me of urgent messages of a certain kind. So it becomes more of an application tool because of that GUI that means users can very easily implement what they're looking for. The next level of notification for us is text notification. And text can be true SMS to a mobile phone if you want to add a, a SMS gateway or SMTP notification to mobile phones or any email address. And that type basically has kind of two flavors. The first flavor is it's just a notification. You'll get the email and it'll tell you you got a new voicemail from John Tyler. And you can embed in that things like click here to go to web phone manager or click here to call into your call express mailbox. So we have, we have a very flexible way of building custom templates for people to use when they want that message to be different. And then the kind of upgrade from that flavor is if the user, if the administrator has enabled the user, they also can get a copy of the message. And they can maintain that from Web Phone Manager. They can go in over the weekend, let's say, and say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going out of town. I'm not taking my business phone. I'm just taking my, my personal phone. I'll only be in, in Yahoo or, or Google or whatever I want. So let me go ahead and arrange to have notifications go to that. So that level of control is first enabled by the administrator, and then it can be actually run, if you want, by the end user. So those are the, those are the tools. The speech interface also does that in terms of term um, some of the notifications on and off, but the two primary tools tend to be the desktop interface with Web Phone Manager and the DTMF interface over the phone. Okay, great. Um, next question. If a user has secure messaging but a message is needed for legal reasons, is there any way to get the message saved out of the system? So there is always a way <laughs> to do anything with our product. Now, the question is, how often do you do that? Um, let's say you do that fairly often. Then we talk about writing a custom app for an administrator to be able to go in and do that. If it only happens occasionally, what, what you can do is you can, uh, well, let's say I have a message and I need it. I can call my administrator, and they can go in short term and allow me to play those messages by downloading them. So that, that is an optional feature on the web client. If I'm enabled, when I click it, it downloads it and it'll open up um, typically media player or whatever you have associated with WAV files. I can then go file attachment save. The administrator can then go turn me back into the secure mode. So if it doesn't happen a lot, that's probably how I would approach it. If it happens a lot, I would talk about building an app to do it. That would be the easier way. Okay. And this looks like it's the last question. Um, with server-based UM, if my exchange is offline, can I still access voicemail via TUI? Will it synchronize once exchange is back on? So here's what's going to happen with server-based with any of the systems. Since I can't push the message, the new message, to the system, 
our system actually is intelligent enough to turn that into a voicemail user. So message comes in for me, I'm normally server-based. Our system goes out and talks to Exchange and it doesn't get an answer. It says, okay, you know what, for right now, let's make Neil a voicemail user. Next time I call into my, mail, in my mailbox and log in, it says, the external message store is temporarily unavailable. You have three new messages, and I can handle those messages over the phone just like a voicemail user. When the exchange system or whatever system it is comes back up, we have a resync package that will make sure that it syncs everything back up, and then all those messages will be moved. If I deleted a message, it will be moved into the deleted folder. If I listened to a message and left it in my mailbox, it will be moved into my mailbox as read, and any new messages I haven't listened to will be moved into my mailbox as unread. If the Exchange server is down, you cannot get to existing messages because they're stored on the Exchange server and we can't connect. So that's the downside. New messages, fine. Existing messages, not until it comes back up. Okay, great. And that looks like that's all the questions that we have. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us again today and look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Also, look uh, for an email for the um, Unified Messaging Report, and we hope to see you soon. Neil, did you have anything to add? Um, just to that, you know, we really appreciate when people come to these webinars. It's, it's one thing for us to arrange to do this. This is, you know, it's on our calendar. It's part of our day. It's what we're doing. For you, you have to take time out of your day to come to these, and we hope we give you enough value to make it worthwhile. And if we do, that, you know, that's great, and you'll keep coming back because we offer quite a few of these. And if we don't, what we'd really like is to hear from you, to let us know maybe the kind of things you would find more value in. Because we do find this a great tool to get information out to existing customers and prospective customers alike. Great. Thanks, everyone.